Hello, welcome to the wonderful world of Remnant Radio. My name is Michael Roundtree. I'm hosting today. Josh uh, is out today. We have Elijah Stevens, and we are talking about the epistemology of miracles. It's going to be a great show. Tune in. You are watching The Remnant Radio, a crowd-funded show where we interview pastors, teachers, historians, and theologians from different churches and denominations. My name is Joshua Lewis, and this is my co-host, Michael Roundtree. Together, we want to help you break outside of your theological echo chambers. If you're interested in learning about history, theology, or the gifts of the Spirit, this is the show for you. Hey guys, we have an exciting show. You might not know what the word epistemology means. You're about to learn that word in the context of miracles. We're going to tell you more about that show in just a moment. Uh, if you are not familiar with Remnant Radio, we interview pastors, scholars, theologians from all over the world and across the denominational spectrum. And uh, and if you are interested in this show or if you've been watching, uh, but but you'd like to be notified whenever we have a show coming up, I encourage you to just hit that subscribe button. Uh, tomorrow we have a show uh, coming out, Can We Trust the Bible? And on Wednesday, you're going to be back with us. Yes. And we're going to be talking about, uh, we're going to be talking about, it, it's our To Be Continued series that's on Wednesday where we're talking about the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And since Elijah's in town, we just said, come on back with us. So we, we pushed back our little revival series we were in uh, one week, and we're going to talk about how do you uh, how do you actually practice the gifts of the Holy Spirit in in small groups, in ministry teams, even from the pulpit, when when it gets ghosty, what do you do? So uh, it's going to be a fascinating conversation. Michael Miller will be with us on Wednesday, too. So um, anyway, so make sure you hit that subscribe button. And as you saw in the intro video, we are crowdfunded. So uh, go ahead and, and uh, if, you, or if you don't mind, or if you might consider... Uh, making a little donation through our Patreon. We provide uh, exclusive content on Patreon. The links are in the description. If you want to make a one-time donation, you can uh, you can do so by also in the description. Find the PayPal uh, link there. So enough of that. Let's dive into the topic. What in the world is... Actually, before we even ask that, how are you doing, bro? I'm doing great. It's good I'm to be with great. you. It's good to have you in studio yes. from Cali. Yes, yes, yes. How, how do you like Texas? I love it. I love it. I love the barbecue and just the cattle walking down the roads. <laughs> <laughs> I, I have not noticed that myself. It's worth. They have like a cattle deal. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. It's intense. You know, that's how it is in Texas. I mean, we just literally you just walk outside. There's cowboys. I mean, they're like, it's like rodeo clowns everywhere. I mean, it's pretty much everyday life for us here in Texas. Oh, okay. But uh, great to have you in studio. We always like to have our guests in studio when we can. And, uh, and so we're talking about epistemology mm -hmm. of miracles. Many of our guests have no idea what epistemology is, but, but given the, uh, just what's going on in our world these days, like things that weren't questioned are questioned. Right. And, and I'd love for you to just define the term for us yeah. and talk to us why this subject matter matters. Okay. So epistemology just means the study of knowledge. So... How do I know if something's true? How do I know it's false? Um, and uh, what is knowledge in general? And so when it comes to miracles, we have this issue of there's a lot of naturalistic things that look like miracles. Uh, you know, if I pray for you and you have a headache and you take two aspirin, the question then becomes, well, did the aspirin heal you or did God? And how would I know that? And so when it comes to that, we live in a culture that people struggle with these things, especially because people go, science has defined away miracles. And so we as Christians need to be able to talk about miracles in a way that actually builds people's confidence that this is a God event rather than maybe something more naturalistic in nature. Okay, so it sounds like, you know, you, you have on, on one side, like the Christian might be, might more readily acknowledge God's hand in a miracle. Right. But you're looking at miracles themselves as an apologetic to the unbelieving world that doesn't necessarily begin with the same foundation as us. Uh, that That's sometimes the case. Other times it's the case that, you know, we as Christians are called to worship God with all of our mind and soul and heart. And we just want to tell the truth. And so you want to hear cases and go, I think this is more probabilistically a miracle, or this may be God's providence, or the dude's lying to me. <laughs> do, do you find that in Christian circles, we're, we're a little like uh, jumpy on calling things miracles? Oh, yes, yes. Like, 
parking like, spaces. Is, yeah. Like, is it is it a little bit also oh, the parking space miracle? Right. Oh man, so many people have gotten <laughs> saved on that one. <laughs> so, uh, and then there's the I caught a fish this big miracle. Right. 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 Like, right, right. So. Okay, so where do we begin in this conversation? I think you need to step back. Okay, actually, have we defined epistemology? We did. Okay. Uh, the study of knowledge. The study of knowledge. Okay. Yeah. So help us understand, like, what does that even mean? Like, okay. How do I know something? How do you know it's? How do you know something's true? Right. So, uh, so this can be epistemology as it relates to religion, epistemology as it relates to science, and you're just saying epistemology as it relates to miracles. How do I know? The miracle is legit. Right. Okay. Right. How do I know God did something that altered the normal course of events? Okay. Yeah. So, um, so where do we start in this conversation okay. then? For me, it's helpful to really define terms. So when we we need to go back and have a framework and start by assuming maybe I don't know if God's real or not. Um, and so for me, what I do is I talk people through. I, I, I just provide them with my framework for how I started working on this problem. Okay. So I, these are some terms that I would like to define. One is a thought. Like a thought's anything that pops into your head. Uh, a belief is something you go, I think more probable than not this is true. So I believe it's sunny outside. Um, another thing is truth. Truth is when something corresponds to reality. So, um, you know, if... Two plus two is four, or George Washington's the first president. That's that's a truth claim. Knowledge is different than truth because something can be true, and I can't know it's true. Might not know it's true. Mm -hmm. So I may have lived in Africa and never heard about George Washington being the first president. And so knowledge, typically in the West, has been ju defined as justified true belief. So that means it's true, and I have a good reason to believe it. Mm -hmm. um, and so, and I actually believe it. So if I say, I think it's raining outside, I know it's raining outside, um, and I go, but I don't believe a word, then I wouldn't claim, say that's a knowledge claim. And so, um, but knowledge claims fall on a degree of confidence uh, whenever we're making them. So <clears throat> the, it's kind of a spectrum. So because you're saying, this is how probable I think something is true. And it can go from impossible, I have knowledge, something's impossible. I know there's no such thing as uh, a married bachelor. Like, that's logically impossible. A square circle, logically impossible. And then I can go from that to this is very improbable, improbable, I don't know. I think it's very probable, or probable, very probable, I'm 100% certain. I'm 100% certain I exist. Okay, so as you're talking through those definitions, yeah. thought, belief, truth, knowledge, right? how does that play into determining the probability of a miracle? Because what you have to do is start looking at the evidence of a case and going, all right, you know, Let's take all sides and all hypotheses of what this could be and then eliminate some and then, oh, we've got two or three left, which is most probable and how confident right. am I that that is the most probable So you're saying this, the distinction in these terms, the reason it's important for you is that it, that it helps you determine like, you know, you might just naturally have faith that this was a miracle right. off the bat, but you're saying... Hold up, wait a minute, right. let's back up. If we're wanting this to be an apologetic before the world and that person got healed of a headache and they took an aspirin 30 minutes before, right. let's let's back up and let's think through this before we trumpet this as our miracle that's going to get the world saved. Right, 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 right. Okay. And Okay, so uh, so you begin with a definition of terms. And I know that, because you and I were talking a little bit about the show, that like... There's a worldview piece to this too, right. whether Christian or Hindu or whatever. Can you speak into the role yeah. that that plays in the epistemology of miracles? Yeah. This is a big issue that Christians just don't like to talk about, uh, especially in charismatic and let's call it renewal and revival circles, um, is that we tend to go, all right, you had an experience of God. That's all you need, buddy. But what happens sometimes, is, and we don't take this into account, 
is that other people have experiences that confirm their religious worldviews. And so you might have an experience, oh, I saw Jesus come into the room and he put his hand on me and now I'm healed. But then there are kids who say, I had an experience where I was reincarnated and I can remember before what it was like. And then I go and talk to people and I become more confident in my experience. Yeah, because I, I think I've read before about a guy named like James Leininger or yeah. something like that. So you're familiar with him. Yeah. So he's, um, if I remember right, correct the details on this, but I, I think that he's like, he's like a kid who had a nightmare that his name was something else, I guess. And yeah. That, uh, and that he had a wreck in Iwo Jima and all of this, and they found out years later that that, actual, that person actually exists that he had this dream about, and he's like, mm -hmm. yeah, I had this dream because I used to be him. Reincarnation's true. Something like that? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So what you're saying on this basis is like, hey, you know, that is pretty uncanny. Right. And for him, it proves reincarnation is valid. Right. So we need a way to validate whether reincarnation is valid or not. Is right. That, that's what Right. And so it comes back to worldview issue is... What type of world do we live in? Do we live in a naturalistic one where, you know, all that exists is material things? Do we live in a pantheistic one that would, you know, reincarnation could be true? Or do we live in a Christian worldview? And so that's where apologetics come in. And so you can study um, the evidence for God's existence. You can read the ontological argument and the moral argument. And William Lane Craig has some great stuff on this in his book, On Guard. You can read about, you know, the resurrection of Jesus. What's the evidence for that? And that's in uh, the case for the resurrection by Gary Habermas. And you can do something called polemics, which is where you debunk other religions. And so there's a great argument against karma, and it goes something like this. Uh, um, karma is taken to be the moral engine of reincarnation. It's it's a law that records uh, moral actions with respect to results of in future lives. However, karma requires moral knowledge and moral evaluations in order to ensure that an inner entity is placed properly in the next life. But karma excludes moral knowledge and moral evaluation given that it's impersonal and therefore the doctrine of karma is false. Therefore, since reincarnation depends on the doctrine of karma, for its moral coherence, reincarnation is false. And so if those premises are true, we can have uh, knowledge that karma doesn't exist. And mm -hmm. so through thinking about worldview issues at a philosophical level, we can start eliminating false worldviews and establish that the Christian worldview is true. Because if you don't know if Christianity is true or not, sometimes miracles are not enough to make you cross the line. Because if you think there's no God, then everything that I could possibly do, like I met a guy when I was making my film who was an atheist. And I said, dude, how atheist are you? Like if you saw a dude's hand chopped off, you, you saw 10 people with this and I prayed for each one and they all grew back. Would you believe in God? And he's like, no, I would just think you like had some futuristic technology. And so his worldview. So very atheist was the answer. <laughs> very atheist. <laughs> Uh, and so his, his, his worldview prevents him from even seeing the possibility of miracle. Okay, so when we're having... The, let's come back to the aspirin headache situation. Yeah, sure. Um, I don't think you're saying, like, hey, in order to figure this out, we need to, like, go and do some apologetics and figure yeah. out if there was the resurrection and figure out if karma happened. It, sound, it doesn't sound like you're saying that. It sounds like you're saying, hey, we need to actually back up and figure out to whomever we're communicating this... Uh, we have to figure out what worldview they're coming from right. to figure out even how we're going to communicate with them. Is this a yeah? Is, so is this more about like how we're communicating it? Is that is that how you would posture uh, it, that's, or is it that's more a part about... of it? But how do I know my experiences are true? Because uh, that boy who had the reincarnation experience goes, I, I've, I've really okay. had something I've experienced, and I want to know is is this a evidence of another worldview. Okay, so you're using this as sort of like on the scatter plot of possible experiences. You're saying, okay, so dude has this dream about a, another dude that he thinks he is now, and he's, he's yeah. come to the conclusion, because of his experience, reincarnation is true. Mm -hmm. And so you have 
using your little system and, and logic, you said, no, we can, we can logically validate or invalidate karma right. a, and reincarnation, which is based on karma, as a proper worldview. So whatever happened there, you're saying it wasn't a miracle? I'm saying it can't be explained by karma taking a soul from a past life and putting them in a body. Okay. So it's, you're saying it might be a miracle? Um, it might be spiritual. It could be, let's say, a, another spirit giving him information. So um, you're right. So you're not concluding that the only miracles that come come from God. You're saying there is such a well, maybe ultimately, yeah. but yeah. like in the in a direct sense, you're saying there is such a thing as false prophets performing miracles, right. demonic Egyptian sorcerers sure. performing yeah. miracles, and those kinds of things. Yeah. Okay. So, but you're saying like if these seeming miracles happen, we should ask the questions, the right questions to figure out, like, what is the cause of this miracle? Right, right. Because if this boy was asking the same questions you were, he would say, okay, this miraculous thing happened, but reincarnation isn't the explanation. Right. Okay. All right. So, dude has a headache, gets right. prayed for. Sure. How does he know? He, he had an experience, his headache's gone. Right. So um, that's a good question. And that's the hardest of questions. Um, I think one thing you really have to do when you talk about miracle is talk about providence. So there's two things at work at all times. And miracle is always defined in relationship to providence. So we don't believe in a God who just like made the world and then left it. And then just kind of at times is like, I'm doing something now. We believe mm -hmm. in a God that guides history through providence. He's always at work in his creation. And other times, he does miracles. And so if I pray for your headache, I can thank God. And you took the aspirin. Thank you, God. Uh, when I'm trying to n work it down into the details and go, is this an act of providence or is this a miracle? That's when the issues start going up. And so when it comes to headache-type stuff... Um, I, I have to pull back and just go, I don't know. And sometimes that's what where you land is the evidence isn't strong enough one way or the other to point you toward, I'm extremely confident God has came into time and space, and this is the definition of a miracle, and uh, changed the normal course of events in a way that they would not otherwise have happened. Right. Uh, yeah. Uh, okay, so we've we've used like a smaller example of the healing of the headaches. Sure. Um, let's go to an extreme example. Mm -hmm. There's some Pharisee who's on this road, I don't know, say to Damascus. Right. And he has this incredible vision and Jesus speaks to him and he's and mm -hmm. uh, and and he has this whole conversation with Jesus. He's converted. He he becomes the apostle Paul. Oh. I don't know if you knew where I was oh, going. Oh wow. With that. Wow. So I mean, are you expecting Paul to just kind of be like, hmm, what's the epistemological mm -hmm. framework for what mm -hmm. just happened? Uh, mm -hmm. Are you saying, yeah, he actually probably should have done that, or maybe he did, or like, how does epistemology of miracles yeah. play into the experience of Paul? Well, what you would see in the case of Paul is this is a highly improbable event. Um, this is a man, he's committed to the... Uh, we, we would call it murder and persecution of Christians. Um, mm -hmm. I, I guess he would call it righteous punishment. And so this change in his behavior for you as a knower goes, it's highly unexpected, um, and you've got to explain it somehow. And so that's what theologians do as they're, they're working through apologetics is they're going – Here's all the options that could happen. You know, it could be Stockholm Syndrome. He feels bad about killing Christians and, you know, self-induces a vision, but that seems highly improbable, and, and start eliminating options. Like you did with the reincarnation. Yeah. You got to yeah. eliminate that as an option. Right. Okay. And so it epistemology is less about the other person and more about you. And I, I, I think sometimes we try to do this back, backwards. I... I tell people when you do apologetics, most people think my goal is to convince R Richard Dawkins and then some people at my church with doubts and then myself, and I've reversed that. I, I just go, my one goal is to go, what do I think is most likely the case? And then maybe it can help some people. 
But if you want to be intellectually honest, you have to work through this stuff yourself and like ask the hard questions and tell the truth the best you can. Mm-hmm. Um, and because that's what it means to live in Jesus. We're children of the right. lie. We follow well, the truth where it leads. Okay, so if I was to push back a little bit, like let's say, um, okay, the Apostle Paul has this experience, mm-hmm. and then a few days later, some dude named Ananias is like, hey, I was mm-hmm. praying and mm-hmm. felt like I should come over here and pray for you because mm-hmm. the Lord told me you're blind. Oh, you are blind? Just like the Lord told me. Pfft, you're yeah. healed. And then the Apostle Paul... Uh, like, does he really need to go through all this process? Or is it more like when you've had an experience like that, the process just happens like that? Well, I think what it does is it builds your confidence over time. Remember that spectrum I'm telling you about, like, man, this is probable. Uh, you know, I had a vision, and Ananias comes and prays for me, and I'm blind, and I get my sight back. I start thinking, this is very, very, very probable. This is Jesus Christ. Yeah. And so... um you want to learn to slide on the scale based on the evidence. Okay. And I think healthy people do this naturally. Like you're not going, this is my checklist all the time you do this. If someone tells you a story, you go, you know, a a husband and a wife are fighting and they tell you a story and you hear one side, you go, okay. And then you go hear the other, it kind of, uh, you adjust based on the evidence. Right. Okay. So... Yeah, I like that because I could imagine this is I could imagine Paul has this incredible experience and his sight comes back and all this and 3 months later he starts thinking, "Yeah, but really? Did I really see that? Right. And did that really happen? And was the sun just really bright that day and mm-hmm. I just kept staring at it so I lost my sight for a few days?" Right. Like we can talk our way out of a miracle. Yeah. You know what yeah. I'm saying? And I we have evidence of, or we have examples of this in scripture with like the Red Sea crossing, you know, like we all think like, how could you live through all the signs against the Egyptians and then the Red Sea crossing and then manna every day and you're like, God's going to leave us out here to die. And it's like, have you paid any attention? Mm -hmm. But I, I think that like the human mind is like set up to forget all the good things God does. Right. Unless we're proactive about it. Right. You know, so it's like, uh, bless the Lord, oh my soul, and I will forget not his benefits. Mm-hmm. And it's like, um, so I, I do think that happens. And, I, and I've just, like an example, examples in my own life, I just have people come up sometimes like, man, you prayed for me and I was healed of, you know, and they'll mm-hmm. share something like, man, that sounds pretty miraculous and awesome. And mm-hmm. I don't even remember it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's terrible. All the time. I'm, I'm a bad human. <laughs> but. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so you're saying that it's like, you know, maybe he in the moment is like, yeah, that was for sure Jesus. He gets converted. Yeah. But what happens three months later and six months later mm-hmm. over the course of time, he can come back and rest on this. Right. And I think this is something that people who live in the West don't understand is your average person wants to find miracle cases where, all right, here's the x-ray, here's the doctor's report, Mm -hmm. great, I believe this is true. Um, But Christianity is an existential religion. So there's objective knowledge about God taught in Scripture. These are theological facts, like God is good, Jesus resurrected, that's a historical fact. Um, But it never wants to leave you there. It wants to push you to live like the truth is true. So Mm -hmm. to put your faith in that truth and go pray for the sick, to go and do the stuff. And so many Christians that I know, they sit in Sunday school, they sit in church, and they're the person who goes, I heard the word and I didn't do it. And what happens is you you lose your confidence um, that this religion can affect your life and transform you and mm-hmm. that God is at work in the world today. But when you start doing this stuff, you start experiencing it. Okay. You start seeing healings for yourself. You start getting prophetic words and giving them, and it builds your confidence. And so part of knowing that miracles happen is living like they do. And if you're not willing to put yourself in that position, oftentimes you... You just go through life and go, I don't know. You can read, I, I mean, I can point you to papers that have been written uh, that, or Craig Keener wrote, uh, you know, a two volume book called Miracles where he documents it mm-hmm. uh, and he does an excellent job at it. But if you don't live it, mm-hmm. what good is that? Right. 
Okay, so let's come back practically to the original okay. question, epistemology of miracles. How do we know sure. that it was a miracle? Mm -hmm. What have we established so far? Keep asking me that question. I, I, I don't get what you're trying to pull okay, from. Okay, so like practical steps of like something happens. How do I like, do I need to go back through worldviews? Yeah. Do I need to yeah. work through definitions? Do I need, mm -hmm. do I have certain... Uh, I mean, what do I do? How do I determine that? Does yeah, that yeah, yeah, sense? yeah. So, um, I I think what you need to do is to realize some miracles in your life are going to be indetermined, and then there are some that, um, or miracle claims in your life are going to be indetermined, and some that are so radically far outside of the box mm -hmm. that when science looks at it, it, they go, "There's no naturalistic explanation for this," and so. For us, what we want to do, I think that's why I work with the Global Medical Research Institute, is to find those cases and start publishing them where you go, we've taken every possible explanation that you can come up with. So, mm -hmm. like, there's lots of naturalistic things when it comes to miracles that um, I could come up with well there's the placebo effect well misdiagnosis uh of the doctor he didn't diagnose it right now you think a miracle's happening it's just a totally different disease and uh you know all of that stuff um people can mistake schizophrenia for the demonic or or anything of that nature and we as christians one of the things you can help yourself is is to learn them uh the naturalistic ways that people mistake for miracles like mm -hmm. con artists and stuff like that and watch out for those types of ways okay so i'm going to want to come back to some of these okay. placebos con artists sure. those, those kind of things uh but i feel like we need another foundational definition okay. because you have uh you've been careful to define faith knowledge truth mm -hmm. worldview epistemology what is a miracle I think a miracle is when God changes the normal course of events so that they happen otherwise than when they normally would have occurred. So so like a, a baby being born, the sun rising, that doesn't count? No, because that's the normal course of events. Like people get pregnant, people win the lottery. Um, so like if, uh, if God's providing manna from heaven, does that not count because it's normal or is it since it's such an interjection in mm -hmm. his normal ways of dealing yeah. with societies, it still counts as a miracle, even though he did it a lot. Right. So part of our issue is that we are, you know, living in a post-Enlightenment culture. And so the Enlightenment started defining miracles in a way that God did not. So in Enlightenment worldview is that something is a miracle if and only if there is no naturalistic explanation for how it could happen. Um, Jesus turning water into wine would be a great example of one of those types of miracles. They do occur. Um, but then there's things that are naturalistic that God does in Scripture, such as he parts the Red Sea with a wind. Mm -hmm. um, and so what we have to do as Christians is not define miracle in a way that there's no known naturalistic explanation, or we end up going, all right, lots of miracles get thrown out. So, and so, so when you use the phraseology of God alters the normal course of events as it would work under right. natural law, typically maybe, yeah. I don't know, I threw the natural law part sure. in, you're saying that way we can still include the wind creating a parting of the Red Sea and right. say that's a miracle. Right. Whereas a, a scientist might say, it was a heavy wind that day. Right, <laughs> right. And that's part of worldview issue is, um, do I allow for a God to exist who can use naturalistic means to perform miracles? Mm -hmm. And um, if you, and so that's why you have to go back and go, is the Christian worldview true or am I using miracles to establish a God's existence? Right. Well, so what do you do with something like, I mean, there are times when cancer just goes away. Right. Spontaneous uh, remission. Yeah. So spontaneous remission. Can we call that a miracle? I mean, science mm -hmm. calls it spontaneous remission. Mm -hmm. Why don't they just call it miracle? <laughs> right, right, right. Um, 
because there's a statistical part of the population under which no one prays for these people, like pretend you're an atheist, um, but spontaneous remission doesn't always act like what you would think it would act because it it's not like there's this big old tumor and it just popped out of existence. It's over a multi-month period of time this thing disappears. And uh -huh. so um, spontaneous might not be the right word for it. Um, but you can even start studying, well, where does spontaneous remission happen? Where does it not happen? Um, and so when you start researching that, you can actually eliminate some things. At, you know, um, does, do bones spontaneously unbreak? You, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, there are certain ones. Okay, well, so let's come back to the, the placebo. Sure affect uh the power of the mind the sure. power of the body like talk through some of these sure uh because there are things that occur in nature that seem like miracles right so how do we rule out some of those things right i think not that i'm trying to rule sure. out I, I want there to be as many miracles as possible right but, right 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 but I, I also i want truth right and and i think that's what he every healthy christian i've ever talked to wants that mm -hmm. um so when it comes to placebo effect, we hear about it. And, and so the placebo effect is... Define when, it for us. Sure, yeah. sure, sure. Is when you give someone a treatment that has no causal power um, and they get healed. So if I gave like a you sugar pill. a sugar pill and it heals you of your direct depression, you go, it wasn't the sugar that did it. Um, but placebo has limits. And the limits typically are pain-related or psychological-related he healings. Mm -hmm. um, I have heard of warts being healed with placebo, but that's about as big as it gets, and I, yeah. I'm skeptical of those claims. Well, so, I yeah, on the wart, my aunt, like, you know, I got a wart when I was a kid, and she's like, oh, you can wish it away. And I was yeah. like, really? You can wish it away? And, you know, then everybody else in the family's like, oh, Aunt, uh, we, her name was Aunt Cuny. I know it's a weird name, but anyway, Aunt, Aunt Cuny, she can wish away warts. And she's like, you know, she just like kind of put her finger over it, but not touch it. And I don't know. Apparently she was doing something. Yeah. Probably I need a demon cast out now. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> your finger starts jumping during church. <laughs> Come get me. <laughs> okay. I'll, I'll let you know. So uh, is that what you're talking about? The power of the mind? I mean, can yeah. people do that? Can they just focus their mind? Can you do it with other things besides, I mean, a wart is inconvenient, the, but could you wish away blindness? <laughs> um, depends. Um, there are types of blindness that are psychologically related. Um, so that the person maybe has a traumatic uh, event happen where they no longer can see, like they had a rape or see someone shot, and it's like their mind no longer processes that. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, first of all, you would have to have a traumatic event causing the blindness. And so when it comes to blindness, there's organic types of blindness. That is, let's say I cut your optical okay. nerve, and then there's psychological types. And so... Placebo could work in some uh, psychological types of What would blindness. you say? Okay, so this is a random question. So I read this in a, a missionary book. I, I, it was either yeah. called The Father Glorified or Miraculous Movements. can't remember. Um, anyway, it was one of those two books, and they're kind of mm -hmm. like companion books. But uh, it was a dude in like a Mus the Muslim world, and um, he got radically saved, vision of Jesus. Like it sounded like the Apostle Paul type story for mm -hmm. a Muslim, and he went blind. But the blindness never went away. Like he mm. just stayed blind. Like okay. do you like and I'm just kinda like that doesn't seem like the kind of thing God would do, but <laughs> yeah. like uh you know, and the book goes on and kinda tells a story and he led a lot of people to Jesus. But um could that have been like a psychological thing? Like it was such like an encounter that it just like kind of freaked him out or something? I don't know. And I don't I don't want to make stuff up. So if, if you're doing epistemology, what you want to do is start with knowledge and build upon it. And so when I hear this case, I just go, there's a lot of stuff I don't know in the world. And so when I want to establish miracles, what I have to do is just give you, here's some knowledge, here's some knowledge, here's some knowledge. This is why I think this is most likely a miracle. So maybe give me a case where, because you, I've mm -hmm. heard you use this language of spectrum a few mm -hmm. times. Yeah. like. Like there's a spectrum of certainty, sure. And 
you it's a lot easier to rule things out sure. by certainty than it is to maybe affirm something right. with certainty. I, right. It seems like you agree with that. So, um, so in other words, we can say that miracle was not because that seeming miracle mm-hmm. <laughs> was not because karma and reincarnation are true because mm-hmm. we can use logic and determine that's not true. Mm-hmm. But um, what certainly was it, or what yeah. what certainly caused this? You know, this dude's apparently psychological blindness, maybe psychological, like what caused this person's headache to heal, whatever. Mm-hmm. So, um, so how do we move to the road of like, yeah. uh, of higher levels of certainty right. that something was God? Well, yeah, let, let's start with that. With I think the Catholics have done a great job with okay. this. Um, so the Catholics use something called abductive reasoning, which is, let's take every hypothesis possible on a miracle. So, a, a miracle claim or a exorcism claim. And so if I'm calling up, you know, a bishop and I'm saying I need an exorcism, before they even begin that process, they will go, all right, let's send this person uh, to a medical doctor and see if there's any medical things. All right, they rule that out. There's no no medical issues. Let's send them to a psychologist. Can this be explained psychologically no. All right. Now let's start signing this guy up for the bishop to get prayer. Um, and also what you can start seeing is positive outliners. So, um, you know, people, let's say, float. You go, I, I can't think of a naturalistic explanation That's just like for a, that. Two two words that it's just sometimes people float. Right, <laughs> right, right, right. Um, I haven't observed this. Right. I, I haven't either. Um, but also faithful witnesses report it. Um, and, it, you know, in law, if I am a person that I don't lie, you accept my testimony. So if mm-hmm. I can say, look, I, I was out in the woods and I saw a guy run past me and he had on a gray ho- hoodie and he's carrying a gun and he said, I just killed Martha. And I have good character in law, you would go... All right, um, you know, I, 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 that gives weight to that claim. Probably it's, not certainty by that point. No, but gives weight. Sure. So sure. it moves you in that direction. Right. Right. So one criteria is the reliability of the people making this claim. Right. Or the people who witnessed it. Right. Or are they of good character? Um, it, Can it I all... stick on that for a moment? Yeah. Okay. Because I don't immediately believe people float. Sure. <laughs> I mean, I mean, when I was a kid, there was this cartoon where this like guy, he, he actually picked himself up and mm-hmm. he floated that way. Yeah. I tried it a whole lot when I was a kid. It never worked. Right. Um, so why, right. Do you, why do you believe this actually happened? I'm, I'm not sure that I believe people float. I'm, I've not ran across a case where I'm like, I'm 100% confident. He's a float. He's a He's floater. A floater. <laughs> um, what I would say, though, is I don't eliminate it as a possibility, and I've heard it enough that I go, hmm, I'm, I'm interested in well, that Well, I'll tell you, stuff. I've heard numerous stories associated with the occult where that happens. Yes. I don't know why that is. It's yeah. like the devil just makes people float or something. <laughs> What he do? It's his job. <laughs> it's his job. It's what he do. All right. So uh, yeah. And so also I would say that um, you know, there there's other types of things. Uh so the Catholics, if you're watching the exorcism, they're like doing this in someone's house at midnight, right? Uh they actually pick the room themselves. And so if objects start moving, you go, hey. I think it's highly improbable that it's our team that started doing, moving these objects. Mm -hmm. And so I think what you see, if you want to start establishing cases, is uh, that the evidence starts to build over time of these outlier events that you go, this seems to be outside of the normal course of events. Yeah, Yeah, well, even in that situation, so there are exorcists casting right. a demon out and things start to move. Sure. So questions I would want to know right off the bat, how many people saw it move? Sure. How much did it move? Yeah. How impossible was it that it moved? Was it like a, a dust, you know, like mm-hmm. a feather or, yeah. or was it a dresser? Yeah. Um, 
and so you just start to think through the the logistics of that and how reliable are these people, which is how, one of how the reliable things. are they? And then put yourself in the situation because I'm telling you, Christianity is existential. You may see that happen one day, and so um, you you may be praying for someone. What would you think that's more likely, the demonic, or would you ascribe a naturalistic cause to it? Mm-hmm. Um, and so, you know. I, I personally have had experiences where I think it's more probable than not that the person literally had a demon and that I prayed for them and a, a demon got cast out. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, can I talk about that for a second? Please. Okay. Yeah. So uh, I was in small group. Uh, we'll talk about this in leading ministry time next time. Uh, but I was leading a small group and there was this girl and. Uh, I just started seeing lights flash over her head. It looked like strobe lights, and I turned to a prophetic friend, and I just... Uh, and you saw that in a visionary way, or yeah, actually... Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I would say they were translucent lights, like it, it was visionary. Were other people in the room seeing it? No, okay. no. Um, <clears throat> and so when I, I turned to my prophetic friend, and I just said, I see lights over this girl, and he said it's about to get wild tonight. And so I'm like, okay. And so I I just walk over to her and uh, I put my hand on her and I say, kingdom of God, come. And when I did, this, by the way, is a girl, I think she's in college, going through sociology class, no past history of she, mental. She's illness. not like dressed in goth, right? And right. like has Vampire a shirt that fangs. says six 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 on <laughs> right. it. No, 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 no. There was no obvious. She was like girl next door sitting there. Yeah. Now, were you like, hey, can I pray for you? You just walk up. Yeah, and... yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I mean, I had the conversation, but I'm just like, can I? Yeah. And I just say, Kingdom of God, come. That's it. And she crinches up like this. And falls to the ground and goes, my name is Lust. And so loud that everyone in the room just like turns over and starts looking at her. And she's like, I used to live under a rock. And like. She said, I used to live under a rock. She did not. Well, the spirit says this through her. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And is it a like, it's a different voice. Different voice. um, Like a masculine voice. Very masculine. Um, it's enough that I'm terrified. Um, like, I feel like I'm talking to something other than a human being. Mm-hmm. And so I pray for her. I cast this out, you know, and she afterwards talks about being molested as a child. Oh. And, uh, and then you know she's like, I feel totally different, and I so we you cast it out. Sure, and and we had multiple conversations after this. Like, what do you think this was? Was she conscious of what happened afterward, or was she yes? Like she out? was conscious during the process, and she's like, I felt so weird. I felt embarrassed, and so it has the markings of something epistemologically different than someone trying to impress. Me, because there was nothing to gain. There was nothing gained in the process. Right. Like, you didn't so, get spiritual status or anything. Yeah, because if I remember right, when Sean McDowell was on our show, I feel like he talked about embarrassment as yeah. one of the criteria for right. how you know something's true. Like, right. like, for instance, in the Gospels, when it was like uh, when women were the ones credited with viewing mm-hmm. the empty tomb at first, like that you wouldn't put that in there if your goal was to convince mm-hmm. others because it was... It would have been an embarrassment to cl- in that culture mm-hmm. to claim women who were un- viewed as unreliable back then, mm-hmm. um, viewed as just hysterical and un- and emotional and, and therefore unreliable. So it, that was his criteria was embarrassment. So you, I see the same thing here. That right. Like um, if if this girl is like, man, I wonder if there's a cute boy in here. <laughs> right. You're like. It's probably not what she's gonna do, right? Like, or, right. I want to make some new friends in small right. groups tonight. Yeah, I, I'm under a rock, or yeah, I, yeah, hide yeah, a, yeah. I come from under a rock. Well, yeah, what did yeah. that mean? Oh, she just talked about how she used the spirit used to go under rocks and hide, and has been doing this for thousands of years. Like, so it's, it's like telling its, it's life auto story. Be there. Yeah, yeah. I'm like, well, thank so, you for sharing, Mister yeah. Spirit of Lust. <laughs> 
<laughs> it's good to meet you. I'm Elijah. <laughs> well, it actually makes me think of Matthew 12 when you cast yeah. the spirit out and it, oh, yeah. and it passes through waterless places yeah. and then, which of course, desert, wilderness, which in the Jewish mind was very much associated with the demonic. Yeah. is it, It's just weird to me. And I would say, on top of that, she was going through a crisis of faith from what I knew back in the time. So it wasn't like you know, pink haired lady that's just like, I want to prove demons yeah. are real. It's like, I'm not even sure God's there. Well, let me ask you this, because this to me would be another, like it wouldn't be like a foolproof, but on the scale uh-huh. of confidence, yeah. this would increase it. Did she experience like a legit freedom yeah. after that? Yeah, she told, like we talked several times and she always said, I, I felt way more free than I used to be. Yeah, so. cool. Yeah, and if, if this was like, if there was like a researcher and that kind of deal, yeah. like I would want to be like, okay, what was your behavior like before? What's your behavior like now? Like right. talk to us about that. But just like in the kind of, the level of conversation that you were able to have with her, it was evident that there was change. And, and this is for the pastors out there. Like you're, you don't run a research center here mm-hmm. at Wellspring. Um, so like you've got to learn to do this stuff on the fly and sometimes what you have to do is just watch it. Mm-hmm. Like, if if I see stuff going on in meetings and it's weird, and I'm like, I don't know if this is the ghost or the the demonic or just a crazy person, sometimes I just stare at it for a long time and go, I don't know. And I usually stuff starts manifesting where you can pick one of the three. Okay, so this one's getting a lot of like questions lately. Yeah, this is probably like a whole episode. Okay, the Kundalini spirit. Sure. Um, can you talk about that for a couple minutes? Sure. What is it, and why are people bringing that up? Mm-hmm. Um, because and how do we know it's that or something different? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Kundalini is a uh, you know a Hindi idea that energy flows through the universe and it, it flows through seven chakras in yourself and uh, it wraps around your spine and the way to experience spiritual enlightenment is to uh, start getting the spirit to go from your butt chakra up to your third eye, and uh, to get <laughs> is that how they word it? Is that how it's written in the no, ancient it's... scroll? <laughs> your your root chakra is what they would call it, uh, and um, so. People report, hey, I, you know, I can, the gurus can, like, transfer energy from one person to another. And this looks like charismatics getting prayer because the the Hindus or New Agers fall down. They have Kriyas, which is the shakes, the charismatic shakes. Why is it called Kriya? That's like a, that is that another Hindi term? Yeah. Okay. So it sounds, to, so the Kundalini spirit is mm-hmm. associated with Hinduism and sure. the Hindi chakra spirit, sevenfold chakra spirit of some kind. Okay, so why is it associated with shaking? Uh, because you just watch, they shake when they're trying to release this energy in themselves. Uh, I mean, it it can look like a charismatic It's, it's a service. violent shake. Yeah. Okay, so they're trying to have a, so in the Hindu world, they're trying to have a mm-hmm. spiritual experience, and they're doing this. And then some Christians are seeing, like, hey, I saw a YouTube video of a charismatic church sure. service, and, you know, Heidi Baker or somebody was mm-hmm. speaking, and everybody start, you know, doing this number. Mm-hmm. It's Kundalini, um, mm-hmm. and, and everybody, you know, a lot of people are saying that kind of thing. So, it, and they're saying it accusatively. They're not saying, like, hey, these people are releasing the right. kundalini spirit and then becoming holy followers of Jesus, mm-hmm. they're saying, like, no, you're actually doing demonic stuff that looks the same as them. Right, and they're so... So how do we determine Well, that? first of all, they're making a logical error. So, you know, Michael Roundtree shakes at his service, um, whatever. So, like, demons cause people to shake and falls down. Michael Roundtree shook and fall down in his service therefore he has a demon, is that the premises aren't necessarily true. So you could shake and fall down because you have Parkinson's. You could shake and fall down because you're looking for attention. So it doesn't provide knowledge 
looking at you shaking and falling down. Um, I think it's called affirming the consequent. Uh, if, if you want knowledge, you have to use a modality to actually gain knowledge. And that you guys have talked about this with Jonathan Edwards, uh, is he saw, and I encourage you, if you think Kundalini's moving through the church today, at some point read Marsden's Life of Jonathan Edwards, because whatever I see at Bethel and read about in the Life of Jonathan Edwards, it's way more intense. They're called the jerks by, back then, and he said— Like it I, was more intense back then? Yeah, yeah. Like, they're going through Great Awakening, and they're experiencing all the crazy stuff. Throughout society, like the entire Northeast is shaking and falling down, mm -hmm. um, and they don't know what to do with it. And so uh, he took First John 4, and he went through it and said, all right, what are the criterions by which I can have confident knowledge that something is of God, is that Jesus Christ is promoted, love is, real Christian love is happening, people are are desiring to give up sin, people want to read the Bible in its historical context and obey it. And he's like, if I see that happening, I know that this is the work of the Holy Spirit. And so I can have confidence that if I pray for you and you shake and fall down and you start, your affections are changed toward those criterion, it's not the devil and it's not kundalini. And so you would say the same thing of so-called holy laughter, maybe? Like, sure. Um, was it of God? Was it? If you don't know what holy laughter is, it was especially uh, prominent in the Toronto Vineyard where, sure. um, where people would just break out in laughter. But honestly, more than that. I mean, I'm reading mm -hmm. about the Welsh Revival, and there was it, they didn't call it holy yeah. laughter, but people would break out. Uh, the the author of the book I'm reading, G, uh, G. Campbell Morgan, talks mm -hmm. about it. But people would break out in uh, in sobbing or laughter right. at various moments. And the Presbyterians during the Great Awakening, there were a lot of reform people having this stuff. Yeah, and so it's not just man these crazy charismatics that don't know their Bible started this. Like you've got to go back into church history and go. Either Jonathan Edwards, John Wesley, and George Whitfield were demonized and just didn't recognize demons in their church, or we don't understand what the Holy Spirit is right. doing. Yeah. So at the end of the day, go go back and, and look up our episode on manifestations of the Spirit sure. by jo uh, on Jonathan Edwards. Go back and watch that episode. That there's a handout that's attached with it. Uh, Catherine Coleman didn't she like break somebody's spine or something like that? Which is kind of the opposite of what her ministry is supposed to be doing, mm -hmm. right? Healing people. But uh, yeah, so yeah. talk to me about that. Like, I didn't really hear a lot of like press on that. But... Sure, 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 sure. Uh, um, what do you want to know about it? How does that play into epistemology of miracles? And well, and this whole sometimes we're trying to heal people and we hurt them um, because we think we're hearing stuff from God. And so, what I would say like, is, what did she literally do? I think like she, she picked someone chop? up. <laughs> What's that old lady karate chop? <laughs> That's supernatural. That was the miracle. <laughs> she could break a spine with just a chop. That's impressive. Yeah. Uh, if she was trying to pick somebody up, you know, out of faith. And I think one of the things when it comes to knowledge and being on a continuum is let's take words of knowledge. Let's take the small voice of God. Mm -hmm. um, what happens with some people is instead of going, I think this is probably the God, God's voice, they take it to, I'm nearly certain this is God's voice, and I'm just going to live recklessly. Mm -hmm. And so one of the things that I think because knowledge falls on us, our confidence in knowledge should fall on a continuum, we also need to mitigate our risk for when we're wrong. Mm -hmm. And so there's a big difference between, you know, I've prayed for people before and that have had, let's say, foot damage and there's a big difference between test that out by putting like a little bit of weight versus jump up and down. And so we we can leave people injured if we mm. don't um, understand that that level of confidence in our knowledge is n are, are, is not warranted. Does mm -hmm. that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Hey, so you, I, I see here in your notes, because um, mm -hmm. it, 
I have some notes here. Uh, and you say, I encourage every healing minister to take an abnormal psychology class and read a little on sleeping disorders. Mm -hmm. And you tie that back to natural phenomena being mm -hmm. mistaken for the de demonic or maybe mm -hmm. vice versa. Um, so can you talk to that? Because I, yeah, I think yeah, that yeah. Uh, it might kind of play back into some mm -hmm. of this conversation about um, that we were having earlier about Kundalini and some mm -hmm. of that stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I, and I don't think everybody knows what abnormal psychology okay. uh, is. Yeah. I'm one of those people. Okay. Um, so abnormal psychology is the study of mental illness. Mm. Um, and so, you know, the APA has been studying mental illness for 50 years and documenting it and doing science. And so I encourage anyone who has an inner healing ministry or anything that deals with heart stuff to go get educated, to learn about, like, what is Tourette's? What is, you know, PTSD? What is schizophrenia and sleeping disorders? Mm -hmm. Because there are issues with the brain that will cause people to experience the feeling of a spirit on them. Um, and so that's why I think it's so important to use abductive reasoning in some of this stuff. And if a person has a chronic hit history where, you know, a doctor is saying, look, dude, you have, we can see the brain disorder. And, and if you have this, you know, showing up on your x-ray, everyone else has this spirit feeling, then um, it's probably not a spirit. And so what happens is... Either the church goes, the supernatural exists, let's throw out science, or people go, science exists, let's throw out the supernatural. And if we want to worship God with all of our minds, what we have to do is go, both are the case, let's take our time and help people the best we can. Does that yeah. make sense? Uh-huh. Yeah. How does the sufficiency of Scripture, 2 Timothy 3, uh, 16 to 17, how does that play into this? So... Uh, the idea that, so I'll quote it, all Scripture is God-breathed, sure. useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Sure. So um, I believe in the sufficiency of Scripture. I say, hey, I point to this verse. According to the Bible, the Bible gives us everything I need to be thoroughly mm -hmm. equipped for every good work. It doesn't mean that the Bible tells me everything I need to be a great accountant. It doesn't mean right. that the Bible tells me everything uh, that I need to be a great... Uh, any, you know, career or anything like that, but it does tell me how to be a great minister uh, mm -hmm. of the gospel, whether right. that's professionally or clergy or laity, but, like, I can serve God mm -hmm. with um, uh, with sufficient resource in the Scripture. Does this, what you just said, challenge that, uh, the mm -hmm. idea that, that, you know, like, we should read on psychology and these other things? Mm -hmm. Does that challenge that in some way, or how would you respond? I would say nearly... Every evangelical university that exists has a psychology department that is wrestling through how do we deal with abnormal psychology and uh, mental illness, mental illness, and 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 how do we apply scripture to this? Mm -hmm. And so there is this hunger in Christianity to help people, and we want to have the, our best and brightest working on that. And so, yeah, if you're a Christian inner healing ministry, go to a Christian university that believes in the supernatural and hear both sides of the argument. Like, we we don't have to be stupid Christians. Mm -hmm. We don't have to turn our brains off. Um, in fact, God loves it when we look at scripture, we look at science, we look at philosophy, and we just try to go, this is what I think is most likely the case. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, Scripture's authoritative. Uh, it's God's Word to us. It teaches us how to be saved. It teaches us how to live. Psychology is not going to answer that for us. Right. But when it comes to, you know, what happens if I take an ice pick and wiggle it up in your brain, it can answer a lot of questions. <laughs> <laughs> Those are lobotomies. So, yeah. <laughs> Delightful. So, <laughs> so um, yeah. hey, I, I see uh, the name here, Bruce Van Natta, and another yeah. one, Chris Gunderson. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, is having, a, and their stories are incredible. I'd love yeah. for you to tell their story. Yeah. And how does that relate to the question of epistemology of miracles? Okay. So, 
Um, Bruce is in my movie, and I'm going to hold off on Chris because I want you to buy my movie. Um, so Bruce was working, and he had a on a semi truck, and the semi truck fell on him, and uh, <clears throat> they rushed him to the hospital. He had three to four arteries, maybe five, that were cut. They had to remove all but 100 centimeters of his intestines. And while he's having this, he's having near-death experiences where his body's floating up into the heavens. And uh, Is he a Christian at this point? Yes, yes. And then uh, he's not astral projecting into the heavens. <laughs> uh, he And, um, you know, angels are surrounding him and... Uh, you know, this, this is a powerful experience. He goes, he has a surgery. Um, they tell him he has small gut syndrome, which is his gut um, is too small for the food to, like, you know, be digested. And that usually results in death because it's, it's, it's too small. And so um, there's this guy gets a word of knowledge, comes and prays for him, and he feels his intestines grow. Mm-hmm. And the word of knowledge is you got something going on in the gut. Uh, I think it's fly to wherever Bruce lived and go pray for it. So a dude gets a word of knowledge to go pray for a guy, and he feels like the snake. Did un- he? Did he? Hold on. Did he know who Bruce was at this point? I, I saw I, your movie, but it was like six months ago. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I can't recall. Anyway, so he some sort of supernatural impression to go yeah. fly and pray for this dude. Yeah, yeah. And when he prays for him, he feels yeah Bruce. The guy who a semi fell on top of. Right. That's terrible. And he's dying from not being able to eat. Like, he's emaciated. Uh, I mean, this is months after the semi f- fell on him. Jeez. And so um, Bruce goes to have another surgery. The The surgeon reports seeing uh, an extra third of his b- bowel in there. And closes him back up. Um, Bruce lives. He's fine today. Um, but the question is, well, do you consider this a miracle because the technology doesn't exist yet to go back and measure? And so, you know, when you're thinking through abductive reasoning, what I do is I go, all right, well, the case progressively gets stronger over time. And, you know, if it came, came back and I said, look, I measured this guy and it didn't work out. Um, You withdraw some claims. You don't throw out the near-death experience. And so that's what thinking on a continuum does. And I think that's super helpful. I think that takes all the stress off on Mm -hmm. trying to determine if something's a miracle. Instead of just a binary, was it a miracle or was it not? You say the evidence seems to point to the fact that it was based on these factors. Right, and I don't have... Like, people want indubability. Like, I'm 100% confident of this. And there's so few things in life. Our tech girl is laughing at indubability. Okay. Uh, uh, It's not a word? word. Oh, quite a word. Um, So it's uh, like my existence is maybe one of the few things I can be 100% confident of. Mm-hmm. And so if you have to have something at 100% confidence to believe it's a miracle. Right, but for some, even that, right? Right. Like, how do we know we're not in the matrix? Right. I mean, I guess you might call that an existence, but are, are we not like on some alien planet and we're just like, this is just a, a projection of our imagination? Right. Like at, at some point, like it, you can play this game to the point where you get to absurdity. Right. And you can say... I think that's probably not the case, and I have no evidence that that's the case. Why should I even believe that? Mm -hmm. Um, You haven't even made a case for me. Yeah. Okay. So summarize everything. Like, let's kind of revisit. We've got epistemology of Mm -hmm. miracles, epistemology, study of knowledge. How do I know Mm -hmm. that a miracle has occurred? And you've talked us through, it seems like if there's one, like, big takeaway, like, that you want people to walk away with... Mm -hmm. What would it be? Think of your knowledge claims about miracles on a continuum. And, you know, do you doubt it a little? Do you doubt, do you believe it a lot? And 
let evidence decide and allow for there to be multiple hypotheses. Eliminate some if you can. Um, and then go, this is my best guess and this is why. And that's all you can do as a human. And uh, that's what I would say. Yeah. Cool. And I, yeah, I like that about the spectrum. And I would say uh, to Christians, don't exaggerate miracles. Like, yeah. God doesn't need your help getting mm -hmm. people to believe in him. Like, I mean, he invites us into the Great Commission. We get to share the gospel. But, like, God can handle his own PR in terms of, like, he doesn't need us to, like, brush up his image right. or anything. Right. Uh, so I just think, tell the truth, because we are called to be truth tellers. The last thing I want to do is to try to convince somebody of the capital T truth, the truth of the gospel, mm -hmm. by lying about a miracle or exaggerating it, right. uh, or making some fanciful claim. And so, uh, and so to really think through these things, and then I think also for me, the nature of faith, because you talked a lot about certainty, degrees of certainty, mm -hmm. and, and one of the things, I, uh, the way I define faith is that faith is confidence in God's goodness, wisdom, or power. Mm -hmm. It's not psychological certainty. Right. And Jesus talks about degrees of faith. He marvels at the centurion in Matthew 8 who has great faith, but then he also rebukes his disciples, O oh, you of little faith. And so there are degrees of faith, uh, degrees of confidence in God. And you can think of it about kind of like stepping out onto, onto ice, like mm -hmm. how confident are you that the ice will hold you up? If you have just a little bit of confidence mm -hmm. in thick ice, then you'll be good. Yeah. The mustard seed of faith will do you well. But if you have a whole lot of certainty, even, in thin ice, then that's terrible. Mm -hmm. So what's far more important than where we fall on the spectrum is the object that we're placing our confidence in. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I think that for Christians, there's a humility, and specifically for continuationist Christians, such as you and me and many in our, uh, in our audience, is, uh, is that uh, we just don't want to um, project certainty where we can't legitimately have it. Mm -hmm. And I and I think that there's actually a humility about that. Like when I'm when I think about like following the leadership of the Holy Spirit in my life and I and I think, man, I, I really think God's showing me to do this or God's showing me to do that. Like there's I've learned over the years with a few swing and misses that like, you know what? I think I hear God pretty well sometimes, but I'm also human. And First Corinthians 13, we see through a glass, but dimly. And, uh, and, and so I just think that it's important for us to, to, yes, have great confidence, but even in that, don't project a level of certainty that no human being can have. Right. And I would add one more thing. Live this stuff. And the kingdom of God is at hand. And I always tell people it's one or two degrees outside of your comfort zone. Like you don't have to become Heidi Baker and just like run up or run up to every person that you see and pray for them. But if you will stretch yourself enough to go, God, I, I know Jesus resurrected. I think that you heal people. I will offer to pray for somebody when I'm mm -hmm. at Starbucks or um, if I feel a prompting, I, I will share the impression that I'm giving. Yeah. Um, you will see the kingdom of God come, and that will do more to boost your confidence than reading a dozen books on this stuff, is because we are designed so that our, we put the most confidence in the things that we, we've seen and done. And so, yeah, I, I would encourage yeah. you, go do the stuff. Yeah, amen, amen. Well, guys, thank you so much for joining us for this conversation. Elijah, it's a great conversation as yes. always. Look forward to uh, having you join us again on Wednesday to talk about uh, how we apply these things into ministry times in church services, in small groups, on ministry teams. Uh, so that'll be on Wednesday tomorrow uh, About uh, is a conversation about how we can trust the Bible. So a lot of good stuff coming up. Please make sure that you hit that subscribe button. Share these episodes if you find them uh, beneficial. And, um, and uh, if you wouldn't mind considering that we're a crowd-funded uh, ministry, so maybe hit that Patreon or uh, Patreon for as little as $5 a month, and you get exclusive content. So uh, please consider supporting us. Uh, God bless you guys, and have a great week.